how was Maribeth even doing that was my first question. How do you look at something that seems so tragic and have such a great attitude? Welcome to the StrokeCast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 157 of the StrokeCast. This week's episode is brought to you by the fine folks at Modus Nova. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. And by the fine folks at Like Minded. To find out if Like Minded can help you live your best post-stroke life, visit strokecast.com slash Like Minded. Maribeth Quinn never expected to be a part of the stroke world. Really, I guess nobody ever does. And then her 19-year-old daughter suffered a stroke while away at school. Sophie lost the use of the right side of her body and her ability to speak. And that was 10 years ago. Since then, Sophie went to physical therapy with Danielle Stoller. Danielle was an experienced physical therapist, but was also about to burn out on the field. Uh, And I know we all hate to lose great PTs and OTs and SLPs, but I think most of us can imagine with what we deal with in insurance, they deal with in insurance, and everybody's dealing with stuff, so it's certainly something we can see happening. So Danielle was about to burn out. She had some ideas on how she could change things in the field, but couldn't quite make it happen. Once Danielle, Maribeth, and Sophie met, things began to change for all of them and for the rest of the medical professionals they would go on to teach. Now, next episode, we'll hear from Sophie herself. This week, though, we'll dive into Maribeth and Danielle's story and learn how they are changing the face of stroke care. So now, let's meet Maribeth and Danielle. Maribeth and Danielle, thank you so much for joining us on the show this week. I'm oh, glad to be here. Yes, thanks for having us. Maribeth, how how did you come to be a part of this stroke support community? Well, um, I guess like most people, inadvertently, I, I just didn't see it coming. Didn't yeah, nobody really plans know, this. Didn't know anything about it. But in 2012, my 18-year-old daughter, who was in her second semester of college in Chicago, we, we got a phone call really late one night that just someone telling us that they had taken our daughter to the emergency room and that she'd fallen on a treadmill. That's all they could tell us. So neither one of us thought it was anything serious. You know, we just thought maybe she's dehydrated or maybe she tripped. Who knows what? But my son also lived in Chicago at the same time. And so, you know, we said, go on to the hospital and just be with her and let us know. But, you know, I kept having doctors call me and ask me the simplest of questions that I knew Sophie could have answered. I couldn't figure out why they were asking me these questions and they weren't really telling me anything. So I I started to feel like, okay, something serious has happened. But then my son called and said, mom, I'm, I'm at the hospital. I'm here with Sophie and she's looking at me, but mom, she's not talking to me. She's not saying anything. I think she knows who I am. And at that moment I thought, oh, I I just, I, I couldn't even imagine what was happening. So we immediately jumped in the car, started heading that way. And And I could tell by his voice, even though I didn't really know anything about stroke, like at that time, I didn't know anything about stroke. I didn't know young people could have a stroke. I knew nothing. I was completely ignorant about the whole thing. But I could tell by his voice, the gravity of it. And so we hung up and I just remember feeling completely blank. Like I didn't have any source of information to kind of tell me what was ahead or to even produce a story out of it. I, I had nothing. And as I sat there, I had one of the most profound experiences. It seemed very short and tiny at the time, but I was just thinking about her and I was thinking, I wonder like where she is, what I, 
I want to reach her. And I had this, it was almost like a daydream. You know, I was, I was standing in my kitchen at home and she, I looked over, I heard her say, mama bear. And I looked over and she was standing at the stairs that come down from her room. And she looked at me and she smiled. And it was, I've never felt like that in my life. It was this overpowering feeling of love and well-being and everything's going to be okay. And sort of like in a dream where you find yourself amidst all this action and then you just, you suddenly get the whole backstory. Like you don't, you suddenly know why you're there and what came before it. That's how it felt. I, I felt like she was saying to me or conveying to me, remember, we plan to do this together. And here we go. It's starting. And I just sat with that for the whole rest of the trip. I didn't know what was ahead of us. But when I walked into her room, when my husband and I walked into her room and I saw her hooked up to everything imaginable and she was completely sedated out. That feeling came over me in this very powerful way of this looks dire, but this is just part of the story. It's not it's not the end of the story. It's not a tragedy. It is the extremely dicey part, but we're going to do this. She can she can do it. And that's sort of the. The mindset, luckily, my husband didn't think I was crazy or that I was in denial. He he jumped right in with me like we understood we've got to be this for her and she's got a lot ahead of her. And so, you know, within the coming days, she they pull her out of sedation. No, they, you know, remove half her skull, skull because her brain is expanding so quickly with swelling and. Uh, when she wakes up, they realize that she can't move on her right side at all. And she has absolutely no language. The epicenter of her stroke was really in her language center. And then it did damage to 80%, over 80% of the left hemisphere of her brain. And so it was a huge impact, of course, on her presentation to the world. She she could no longer understand what we were saying. She could no longer express herself. She had half of her skull removed. It was monumental. But it was in that time that I realized, because it was so extreme, I realized that we we didn't have tons of choices. We only had two. And it was to lose hope or it was to go all in and just be, just decide right then we were going to get through this. She was going to, regardless of what her life looked like eventually, that she was going to have a rich life and she was going to fulfill her dreams. Maybe not in the way she had envisioned up till then, but in a way that was equally enriching as she had envisioned. Here we are 10 years later. We've learned a lot. I had no idea how the brain heals so incrementally, so slowly. But she is still, to this day, she is making gains. that It hasn't slowed down at all. In fact, you know, a lot of people get told at first that they only have like six to 18 months maybe to see any recovery. I don't know if you experienced that, Bill, but... A lot of people do get told that, and there's absolutely no accuracy to that. Like in fact, that, that should be a prosecutable offense. I, I agree. It is so mm-hmm. irresponsible because it's it's not true. And I think what it sets up people to do is give up after when they've reached that marker. They think, well, that's it. And really, our experience was that in that first six to eighteen months. Her brain, I think, was doing so much internal healing. We actually saw very little outward change. She did get gains. She did make changes. But it took a long time for her to get to the space where she could she could really start making changes that were showing up on the outside. You, You can't you can't start rebuilding the building until you fix the foundation. Exactly. 
Exactly. And if it left me with a passion, it is to, because, you know, the people that go into this line of work, therapists, neurologists, you know, surgeons, all these people, I have such admiration and, and respect for them committing their lives to such an amazing thing. I am deeply, I have a deep gratitude for that. And I also have a really deep passion for showing them how powerful they can truly be by getting educated about what it's really like and learning how to speak the language of the human heart and the human spirit, because that is where recovery, that's what's driving the whole thing. And I think for therapists, you know, Danielle and I wound up deciding we really wanted to work with therapists on this, but I think the education is so, and rightly so, the education is so focused on the physical that they don't get any education on the other part when it's really the other part that is driving the whole process. There's a lot of stuff to unpack in that in that discussion. First of all, we, I, you know, it's such a powerful story about Sophie, and we're going to hear from Sophie in the next episode, and uh, she's going to get to tell us her story. The other thing I think is really powerful when we're talking about that, uh, one of the things to keep in mind about a lot of the therapists and the hospitalists, especially anybody who works in the hospital, they see us from our absolute worst and weakest. And the last time they see most of us is when the insurance company has said, you know what? I think you can go home and not die right now. They don't (laughs) see us recovered. And that's why, you know, as a survivor, if you're looking to do a good deed or whatever, and especially as COVID uh, restrictions relax, and it's a year or two years or three years or however long it's been, Go back to the hospital where you spent time. See yeah. those therapists. They may remember. They there's a good chance they'll remember you. If they don't, that's fine too. Say, hey, you worked with me a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, whatever. Here's where I am now. Because they don't yeah. see that. They don't see that ongoing recovery that we go through to live that next life and to build that new life and to turn that stroke a- as horrible as the experience is into just one more part of the tapestry that is our life Mm -hmm. going forward. The other thing I want to mention there was at the very beginning of your story, you're in that car and you're listening to the doctor and the doctor isn't telling you all the details because they probably don't know them, but you get a sense of the severity just from the tone of his voice and the gravity of that. And We all communicate so much beyond just our words. And that increased awareness, I think, is one of those things that's very important about the work that you're doing today. So, you know, when we start talking about the work that you're doing today, I mean, how did how did you and Danielle first connect? You know, when we wound up getting out of inpatient rehab in Chicago. We just stayed there and and did it there. And we came home. Danielle wound up being one of her first. She had one other therapist for just a wee bit before we met Danielle. Talk about the the communication, the nonverbal stuff. You know, when, when someone introduced us to Danielle, she came over. I just immediately trusted her. Like there, there was something just about her energy. She didn't talk a lot. Um, she wasn't overly trying to make us feel okay or welcome. Nothing. It was just her. She was, she was stable. She was calm. Most, mostly what I noticed is she was really locked in on Sophie and was really relating to her. And Sophie at the time, she could hardly say anything. <laughs> and I, I just noticed how she was looking at her, how she had compassion written all over her face. Not pity, but real, just human compassion. And let's be friends. I want to help you, you know. And 
years later, when Sophie could express herself better, we were all having dinner together and Sophie shared that when she first met Danielle, that she remembered Danielle looked at her and she smiled and she winked at her. And she said, and I knew everything was going to be okay. (laughs) And, you know, Danielle doesn't remember doing that. Like, you don't remember that, right? No, not specifically. No, I remember the moment I met her, but I don't remember a specific smile or wink. And it just, you know, it just conveyed so much without saying anything. And it wasn't even because she was trying to convey that. It's just how she was. And that's really a big part of what we work with therapists, too, is this isn't like a formula you put on people. This isn't like you say this, then you say this. It's no, it's about the way you are. It's about the way you think. It's about the energy that you're bringing into the room. That's how you're communicating. Your words, actually, you know, if you live with someone that has aphasia, you learn very quickly. Our words actually mean very little. Mm. In, in terms of communicating truth and emotion to one another. And in fact, a lot of times we use language to sort of cover things up. And, and it's just a really great education because you realize, wow. I, so I'm mostly communicating in other ways, but I don't know very much about those ways. Maybe, maybe I could learn about that and really sort of master this and become really, really good. So. Uh, one of the things I think is really interesting there, as you said, Danielle, you don't remember doing that wink or that particular smile. I think that points to the genuineness of it rather than it's not that there's this mm. standard operating procedure you have when you meet a new client, a new patient. Oh, you have to do this, this and this to make this particular environment. Right. So, so Danielle, I mean, what was it that got you interested in even pursuing this rehab space as a field uh, to begin with? Because that, I mean, that's something a lot of folks don't even know exists when they're in high school and starting to make those decisions. Right. Actually, um, I did come about it sort of by accident. I have an aunt who I just adore, who's a pediatric audiologist. And at the age of 16, I decided I wanted to be just like her. Mm-hmm. So I went and observed her at work. And she had arranged for that afternoon for me to observe her colleague in the physical therapy department. And when I went to the PT department and saw the therapist working with the kids on the mat, helping them climb, helping them walk, that just really seemed like a, a real match to me. I was in athletics. I just it felt like this is what I want to do. So I pursued it. And as I went through school, I thought, okay, I definitely want to work with athletes. I want to do outpatient orthopedics. This is where I can be of best help. And when I got my first job in outpatient orthopedics, I did not like it at all. It turned out it was not for me. I reached very quickly a point where I thought, well, I have to change careers you know, change what I'm doing in physical therapy or get a new career altogether. And I have remembered my spinal cord injury rotation as a student um, had made me very happy. So I sought out a neuro job. And when I started working with neuro patients, something switched. I, I just wanted to learn more. I was really into how do I help these people transform from this place of disability into something much more functional. And I really liked being a part of that. So over time, I just became more and more specialized into stroke patients and got more education there. And really, since about 2007, I have focused primarily on adult stroke rehab. So I worked in the hospital system about 19 years and then transition to a full-time cash-based private practice where I see private clients. And at this point in my career, I couldn't be happier with my choice. (laughs) Well, one of the things I think is really interesting, and I think even a lot of survivors don't realize this, 
but you touch on this difference between what most of us think of as uh, as PT and neuro PT, because a lot of the PT clinics that are out there and a lot of people in PT, when they're helping you rehab a knee or an elbow or a muscle or an injury or anything like that, and that's very important work, but they are working specifically on the damage to that limb. In stroke and neuro, uh, as we already said, there's no damage to that limb. It's about how do you nice. get upline and further work on that neuro connection to make that happen. That's a fundamentally different approach to therapeutics. Absolutely. Um, in neurotherapy, you are talking to the brain with everything you do. A good neurotherapist understands that. And when you're talking to the brain, not only are you working with the physical action that you're rewiring, but you're also working with the emotions. And when you can develop skill, um, not only your clinical skill, but your skill in human presence and connection, your impact can really skyrocket. What was it like to start working with Sophie and her family? Well, right away when I met them, um, what I noticed was that Maribeth had a very different way of being in the world around somebody who had had a stroke. Maribeth had this energy of certainty, of clarity that everything was going to be all right. It, it was not just optimistic, but it was very steady and calm and loving. And, you know, she dealt with Sophie's deficits beautifully. And there were a lot of them. As she said, Sophie could very, uh, hardly speak at all. And as I was working with Sophie, I could tell that this support she was getting from Maribeth and her family was really having a positive impact on her recovery because they were the cocoon in which she was recovering. And it was, it was really making a, a big difference. So as I watched this and I started thinking, and how was Maribeth even doing that was my first question. How do you look at something that seems so tragic and have such a great attitude and then, since it was having such a great impact on Sophie, I started to think, how can I take what she's doing because she loves her daughter? How can I take that and turn it into something that I can use as a clinician and give to all of my patients? And what does it say in the research about how we're all connected and how our mindsets affect our performance and how our emotions affect each other? And what does it say about when stress is lowered and how the brain functions? And when I looked into all of that and started talking with Maribeth about these things, I realized there are so many things as a therapist that we can do, that we can intentionally utilize that really stack the odds for success in a patient's favor. I mean, you're talking about Maribeth's care for Sophie and love of Sophie and I would imagine that most, while you don't see a ton of young people in practice, you do see, you do see some, and you do see parents with their children, and presumably all these other parents love their children too. What was just that fundamentally different about the relationship you saw with Maribeth and Sophie? Well, I think now that I know Maribeth's story, I think the fundamental difference was Maribeth was looking at Sophie as this is not the end point. This is just this is just part of the story and everything's going to be okay. So she was bringing that well-being into every interaction she had. And yes, you are right. Certainly everyone is, they care for their loved one. But the energy of um, urgency to get better the energy of what if they're like this forever. There's a lot of anxiety that comes along, understandably so, when someone has a, uh, something like a stroke. So that sort of energy that that comes naturally, Maribeth was, if she had it, which I'm sure she did because she's human, she was able to put that aside in such a way that what came through more more significantly was the stable feeling of of well-being. And what we know about emotions from science is that 
we will catch the strongest emotion around us. So Maribeth held that so strongly that I felt it and Sophie really felt it. So Maribeth, then this sounds like it's a fairly unique type of experience that Danielle uh, observed in your relationship. What is it that you think about your background or your view of life that sort of uniquely prepared you for this moment to be able to have that approach with with Sophie? Well, you know, I've, I've wondered that myself many times. I, I think the best I can come up with right now, ask me in 10 years, I bet I'll have more. <laughs> but um, the, best, the best I have right now is that I, you know, I've always been, I've always read a lot about thoughts for, for a number of years before this happened. I had been reading a lot of things about our thoughts and how they shape, uh, they shape our actions, they shape our feelings, they, you know, all of this. And that you, and understanding that thoughts just happen unless you practice. And when you practice thoughts, which had never occurred to me before, that then you can start to have control in an area that previously felt beyond your control. And so I had been doing that a bit. And one of the thoughts that I practice a lot was, you know, no matter what happens in maybe in the big picture, all is well and and everything is is good. Now, that seems simplistic and ridiculous, and I don't even know that I believed it myself. But I will say I practice it so much that when Sophie had her stroke, that was the first thought that I had when I looked at her. That experience that I had that I told that I opened up with had a huge impact on how I felt. It was like it gave me a, a feeling experience. I don't know where it came from. Who knows? Maybe it was my own brain producing it for me, or maybe it was something more spiritual. I, I don't know. But I know that the effect was that it gave me like this experience of a feeling that then I could keep coming back to. And when I went in and saw her and I really needed it, I, I made this choice that you really don't make in the luxury of everyday choices, right? But when you're staring at a potential catastrophic event, you have two choices. <laughs> it's like, I'm going all in on this or I'm, or I'm walking over the edge here into the abyss. And so I really did have a very singular focus at that time. Now, I remember that um, a year and a half, a couple years into the whole experience with her trying to recover and all of that, that started to wear off. And I had to start figuring out how to produce it myself Th through practice, through focus, through a, a myriad of things. Just it had to be something I paid attention to. It was part of my self-care. It was part of my health plan. Now being 10 years out, you know, a couple of years ago, someone close to me and, and, and our family died and I had grief over that. And what I found was that now that Sophie was getting better and better, I felt like it was almost like my body was saying, okay, now you grieve. Now, now you go through this. And so I, I really have been grieving a lot more. I'm looking back to those early days and going, I don't really know how I did that. It was like, I literally did just put it aside and I knew my job was get her through this. My job was uh, to love her and to see her as I knew she was, not as who she was presenting herself to be in the moment with the brain damage and the deficits. I knew who she was. We all have who we really are. And then we have who we're presenting ourselves to be in the moment. And that felt like what unconditional love must be is where you just see you see the whole person. You see who they really are. And that's how I related to her. That's how I talked to her. And so this, this whole journey has, you know, I've had my own separate journey from her of just trying to figure out how do you process loss? How do you stay positive and process loss? This is not something we talk a lot about in our culture. 
And um, it's, 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 it's an interesting journey, but it's worth going. As we look at it, it's one thing to look at this is, yeah, this is what happened 10 years ago. And this was how you needed to, to be 10 years ago. And a lot of folks may think, well, yeah, I already have my stroke. I'm probably not going through this again. But this is a this is a mindset that is not just about stroke, and with everything we see going on in uh, in the world today, everything between the pandemic, between the social upheaval, with the uh, the war happening in Europe right now, all of this, our reactions. Sadly, none of us are done with trauma and tragedy. And it's, you know, I, I, I know it's it's kind of a bummer to say it, but we're going through more of this stuff and it's going to happen. The longer we live, the more likely we are to have more of this stuff happen. And it's so important to try and add these additional tools to our tool set. Right. Right. And I and I think that this is one thing that both Danielle and I have really um, what's what's come into strong focus for us about someone trying to recover from, a let's say, a stroke and, and the people trying to help them. Um, there's so much focus put on the physicality of that journey and and the are you getting better? You know, what are your symptoms now? And, and all of that. And really, it is. It, it is at its basis about transformation. You know, you've, you had who you were. And even if you, even if you um, are somebody who's, who's lucky enough to recover all of, get, get past all of those deficits, maybe you still have transformed into something else from that experience. And I think the, the people that, sort of figure that out early on and give that some loving kindness and attention are the ones who seem to be most resilient and have the grit to just keep getting back up, keep going after it again and, and figuring out how to um, say I'm this and this instead of I used to be this and now I'm this. You know, hmm. so it's it's there's a lot going on in someone trying to recover. What we want to say to therapists is you might see your job as just being this physical thing about your clinical skills. What you're actually dealing with is so much bigger. And you can get skills in these areas. You can. And your job becomes so much richer because of it. One of the two greatest episodes of Star Trek Next Generation is a story called Tapestry, which is a story of, uh, you know, g non geeks. You can you can sort of tune out for the next twenty seconds. It's a story of of Captain Picard meeting with Q and uh, about regrets in his life, about when he got in a fight that caused him to have to get an artificial heart. He gets the opportunity to redo that moment, and he does, and it just pulls apart all the great things in his life that have happened since then. Mm. Because even those traumas, those are part of that rich tapestry. Those are part of our story. They make us who we are today. Yeah, that's beautiful. It really is. And I think, you know, this is the thing. Um, I, I know that that a lot of people wind up getting told to just be positive. You know, j just be positive or be grateful that it ever happened when sh when really what you're saying is that it's figuring out how to do all of it. That's where that's where the richness is. It, it's not in just being positive or just being grateful for something that everybody else might call tragic. And it's not also just going down a dark hole and saying my life ended the day this happened. It's about figuring out how to grow something out of what happens to you, whether you're a therapist that faces this every day or the mom of someone or someone that it happens to happens to you in your own life, how, figuring out how to experience all of it and get the, the fertilizer out of all of it is really, it's such a beautiful thing and such a rewarding thing to be a part of. I learned very early on that a positive attitude 
is nice, but ultimately meaningless in my recovery. What mattered was an action oriented attitude, mm-hmm. being willing to go ahead and do the work and take the step. Uh, and even later on, we start talking about attitude, right? Attitude is a necessary condition for recovery. Mm-hmm. If you don't have the right attitude, you won't recover, but it is not sufficient. There's so much other stuff you need to be able to do. Yeah. So, so Danielle, we've been talking a lot about the research is supporting more of the emotional support and more of this whole person approach uh, that you started diving into in the midst of your professional career. At at what point did you realize that there was something lacking in the traditional neurotherapy training and neurotherapy recovery field? Um. Well, that's interesting you to ask at what point. I think it was a gradual realization. And I'll tell you what was happening to me as I was going through my career. You know, at first it was orthopedics and it didn't fit with me. And then I found neuro and I was getting more and more specialized in my education. But I was still um, not thriving. I felt like something was missing and and all of the other aspects of the healthcare environment were sort of weighing me down. You know, you mentioned it earlier, the insurance restrictions. Um, There's productivity expectations that you have. There's all of these things that um, you have to document and make sure you do right so that the patient can, can get the care they need. And so you're pushed as a therapist to get these results. And they have to be these physical results. They have to show these functional improvements so that they can keep coming to therapy. And by the time I met Maribeth, I was really burned out. I w- it was the emotional toll of it was uh, weighing down on me. And I never really felt like I was succeeding enough for these patients because I knew the brain had more potential. I knew we could get it, but the environment didn't seem to be supporting it. After about 10 years in my career, when I was focused so intently on the physical aspects, it was really about all I could take. And I was considering leaving the the profession altogether. But when I met Maribeth and I, it, it was probably just where I was and what she was bringing that made this whole thing spark. Because when I met her and I realized, oh, there's this whole other side, there's this whole other set of skills that I'm not using that will help me get these results that I'm looking for. That's when things started to turn around. So as you've gone through this this journey with Maribeth and Sophie then and began solidifying this new paradigm for care and this new way to approach it, the two of you have gone together to work on expanded practice now. And, and what is expanded practice? We teach therapists a system. It's a thinking process that makes them master communicators so that they can navigate these psychological and emotional elements that are at play between them and their patient and within their patient as they're treating them. And what this helps therapists do, it helps them connect with their patients more significantly and feel more effective and enjoy their job on a whole new level. Because once you start interacting with this patient, your patients in this way, it starts to change everything about your life. You can't start being more compassionate in one place and not have it affect other relationships. And we have a passion in expanded practice to help therapists and patients both reach their highest potential. One of the biggest misconceptions that therapists have is that they think they have to spend a lot of time in their sessions to work on this emotional part and, or they have to, you know, become someone's counselor and they really aren't comfortable in that realm. And that's not what we're talking about at all. What we're talking about is taking these human interaction skills, things that are supported by science, understanding how we all powerfully affect each other, and then harnessing that power while you treat, infusing it into your sessions and your interactions. And when you do that, your patients start to respond in ways they haven't before. And that's when you really start to thrive as a therapist. Well, that's great. Well, what I like about that is it's not 
you, you know, my stroke was on my right side, so I've now biased more heavily to the left side, which makes me sort of roll my eyes that much harder than anything that seems a little woo woo, new agey kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's not what that's not the stuff you're talking about here. What you're talking about is communication techniques and practices, things for recognizing more of that whole person that just makes it more effective. And I think there's a lot of value in that. I I think when we look back over the last 20 years at just the huge growth of social media, uh, whether that's going to be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, podcasting, whatever, YouTube, it's because there's a fundamental need for human beings to be heard. To have their experience shared and validated, to to be seen by somebody else. And I think a lot of times when we encounter institutional care, amazing people in there. But as you point out, there are structures that hinder the ability to actually listen and connect with and, and be present for the other person, which, which then drives frustration, uh, and just hinders our overall, uh, personal experience. Yeah. Yes. So, at, you know, when we're talking about these skill sets, we're talking about these techniques. How do you then work with other therapists to help them grow these skill sets and to become then, you know, essentially more effective communicators with their with their patients and with the caregivers? Well, one thing that we really um, we really make sure that we do is not just disseminate information exclusively. We actually try to work directly with therapists because what we're talking about is, like I said before, it's not a formula. It's, it is a shift in your perspective. Um, it's, it's making them aware of different parts of themselves or different parts of the way we communicate. And with that awareness, things start to change. You know, you can't, change something you're not aware of in the first place. We really work on the perspective and the way also that they define their job, you know, by explaining to them how it is that people really heal, how the brain really changes. It's not only doing physical repetition, repetitions of something. It's th- there are a number of things that are at play here. So when we're talking about Expanded practice, it's great to reach out to individual therapists and work with them. How do you also then work with institutions to drive greater change within their own staff for patient outcomes? Yeah, that's a great question. We have taught courses for local hospitals where they open them up for their entire therapy department. They're they're really interested in this topic and how to produce um, more patient satisfaction and how to get this connection and have happier staff. We've also started working with a OT school where we're talking to students um, before they even go out and providing continued education course for fieldwork educators. So we're reaching a bigger uh, group of therapists at a time. But But you hit the nail on the head because um, institutions are big systems and big systems move much more slowly, but individuals can move quickly. And that's why we have really worked mostly directly with therapists. And we do that through our our main flagship program, which is called the Indispensable Therapist. But our, our goal is to move enough therapists, move enough individuals that something will change within those systems because that's where we're going to have the impact the fastest on patients anyway with each one of those therapists. I work as a corporate trainer. Uh, I'm always in that space of trying to navigate the question of top down versus bottom up to drive change in the individual level. So it's always a complex mix of things and best practices. And I love that you're talking to OT students as well, because you want to reach people before they have the time to develop bad habits. Yes. Yes. I think that's great. So then does the programs that you're offering, do they tie into the continuing education requirements that therapists have to do to meet their, uh, their ongoing state licensing? 
Yeah. So as I mentioned, we do have a live course that you can, um, that we're happy to give to facilities or um, someone can host where you get continu continuing education hours. We also have a digital course called How to Communicate with the Healing Brain Like an Expert that has CEUs. And that's a great course to get you started. But if you're really looking to ramp up your impact and treat in a way that affects your patient on a multidimensional level, that's going to really transform your career and help you connect with your patients in a more significant way, then investing in yourself and in a program that's going to give you those skills is really priceless. And that's the feedback we've gotten from our courses um, and our, you know, the ones where we work directly with those therapists. That's the kind of feedback we're getting. And we're very pleased with that. We're hearing things like their burnout is going down, um, that they're they're able to manage difficult patients in ways they couldn't before, that um, they now can handle being both um, a mom and working, whereas before they were feeling like they were strung out. So, um, wait, 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 wait. You mean that my therapists have life outside of therapy? We do. They're like moms and family members and whatnot. They're not just like living in a special dorm in the hospital to provide therapy for me? Believe it or not, they do go home at night. One of the things that was uh, amused me was I was sitting at the Starbucks in the hospital when I was an outpatient and getting caught up on something for whatever reason. I hadn't gone home right away. And one of my inpatient therapists came down on her way out and stopped to chat. And she was wearing her bike gear <laughs> And not in scrubs. For the, it was the first time I'd ever seen her not in scrubs. And it was like, uh, it, it just sort of shakes your world a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like seeing your teacher at the grocery store. It's like, what? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I, I really love this approach, especially this importance of addressing the personal burnout the therapist may feel, especially here we are in the spring of 2022 as we are talking and geez, we've had two years of COVID and mm -hmm. on, on top of just all of the other nonsense that's out there. How does a session actually look different before and after going through this program? Uh, Maribeth brought up this analogy um, not too long ago. She said, it, it's now that we all have this awareness of COVID and that we could be transmitting something that we don't even know we have, or we could be catching something from someone. We know that when we get within a certain proximity of them, things are happening. And that's exactly what's happening between two individuals. So when, when you have the skills that we're talking about, you understand that when you walk up to your patient, it's already begun. You are already affecting them the electromagnetic waves from the heart of one person can be picked up in the brain of the person standing next to them and it creates some sort of reflection. So that's why, one of the reasons why, we feel calm when we're by a calm person. So I know when I'm coming up to a patient to meet them for the first time that my state of being is already having an impact on their body. So it starts with me. I am. I have to get myself centered before I go out there. We said earlier too, emotions are contagious and our communication is nonverbal. So I know now the way I look at you, the way I stand, the way I talk, the way I talk to someone who when I'm not even talking to you, you are making um, a story about that. Your brain is working. It's creating an emotion and that emotion is affecting your body. So then I bring you back to the clinic. I also know from research that we treatment may work better if we believe we're in good hands. So you need to be confident in me. So this sort of thing is very important. The way, the way you um, set the patient down on the mat, the way you bring equipment over, if you're fumbling with things, um, if you're distracted, if you're, if you're talking to your colleagues, you know, that patient is picking up on that and all of these things are affecting their body. So that's another thing we do. Um, we give a therapist a thinking process, you know, like if you get distracted, if you start feeling nervous, if 
you maybe don't know what to do in a session. How do you bring yourself back to a stable place? It's, it's, there are so many things that we do, Bill. It's really hard to pick out because, like we said, it's not a formula. You're really going to react to that patient. You're going to respond to that patient intentionally and say and do and be in ways that support their healing. I think one of the things that's really interesting and that you, you mentioned earlier on, uh, Mary Beth, and when talking about, you know, how much uh, Sophie is able to communicate even before she had all of her, had so much vocabulary back. Yeah. It's that when you think about working with somebody with aphasia and how much you understand about what they want to say yeah. and about what they're trying to communicate with you, you're putting out just as much data even when you have your folk vocabulary as they are. You're just supplementing it with voice. If you take away your own voice, you're still communicating all exactly. of that. Exactly. And, and if you watch the way other people communicate with someone with aphasia, you really see the people that are taking it at face value. They, they communicate with them in such a way, maybe the tone of their voice or the way they look at them. It, it, it can communicate that they're not having a rich thought life because that's the impression that maybe you get when you don't understand aphasia. But you really notice the people that even though they're like the people like Danielle with my daughter, when she when Sophie really couldn't say anything for that number of years, they communicated on such a deep level because Danielle was doing the work of imbuing her with this rich thought life. She was seeing her as she really was. She wasn't just taking it at face value. And so that makes a big difference. Sophie knows when you're doing that. She knows when people, someone is looking at her and assuming that she has a lot going on in her mind. So even though she can't express it, she expresses her emotion in other ways. And that to her is communicating. So that's a really powerful thing when people know how to do that. And that brings us to our hack of the week. But first... Let's talk about sponsor Modus Nova. The key to getting back the use of a hand or foot for many stroke survivors is simple. It's repetition. It doesn't mean it's easy. It's about moving that limb again and again and again thousands of times. Early on, that might mean a therapist helps move it or the survivor moves it with their unaffected side. Eventually, we may just get a tiny bit of control back and can try repeating that again and again. The modus hand and modus foot help survivors do that while they play video games. The devices assist or resist motion during at-home sessions to help you get in the thousands of reps needed for recovery. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. Use promo code STROKECAST for 10% off your first month. And now back to our hack or hacks of the week. The people that seem to keep changing for years and years and years have somehow figured out how to not look at their life as having ended on that day that they had this horrible thing that happened to them. And now they just see themselves in this limited fashion. They somehow find out how to process all that loss. And there is a lot of loss. I know this. There is a lot of loss. But and, and your identity is gone in many cases. But figuring out how to relate to yourself and and find through those ashes, find those pieces of yourself and put them back together and not assume that it's not going to be as as rich, but just hold out hope if you need to, if that's all you've got. But keep going, keep going and, and relating to yourself and to your life as something you expect to eventually be fulfilling and rich again to you. That's that's what I have seen. And, and that's what we really want to enlighten therapists with, that that is what is necessary. 
it's not just about getting physical deficits fixed. Is someone that really keeps going and finds a fulfilling life again is is someone that has to all tra- also traverse this ground. And and it's some heavy duty work and you can't separate it from the physical stuff because they're being triggered and wired together at the same time. You know, research shows that being surrounded by nature lowers your stress and enhances your body's ability to heal. And one study found that people in a hospital with a view of a tree had shorter post-op stays, took fewer painkillers, and got along better with their nurses. So, (laughs) you know, your mindset is everything. The way we perceive things is our experience. So you want to take care of that mindset. So now that we know that nature is nurturing, soak it up any way you can. Walk through the park, take a drive through a tree-lined neighborhood, or just, you know, simply rearrange where you work so that you can see out a window. And if you can see a tree, it's even better. Um, We have a a patient education resource, actually, that's six easy science-backed ways you can help your body heal. We can give you the link you can put in the show notes and someone can go get it. Uh, If you have a disability or if you're a therapist even that would like to share it with your patients, um, there are things just like that that are things you can access very quickly in your everyday experience. And one of my uh, talking about going out in nature and just going out and walking around, uh, you know, one of my places I typically recommend a lot of people who want to go out and walk in a nature place, but maybe your parks aren't great. Uh, depending on your mindset and how you view things, I find cemeteries to be wonderful places to go walking. Mm. Uh, they're typically very well maintained. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's typically fewer people there, so it's quieter. Uh, and if it doesn't creep you out, it's it's a great place to just, it can be a nice place to just walk, to see, to be quiet, mm. and to, you know, contemplate the lives that make up the communities we're all a part of. It does make you a little glad to be alive. <laughs> it, it it does. It does. It does. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm also always fascinated seeing people who passed away a hundred or seeing the, the markers of people who passed away a yeah. hundred years ago and just thinking about, you know, their life and uh, taking a moment to just, you know, sort of say their name yes. and, uh, Love that. And, and and recognize that, but uh, I, again, it's it's a great it's a great physical environment to respectfully be walking around, and uh, if it doesn't creep you out. Anyway, on that on that weird note, uh, <laughs> if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, or learn more about expanded practice, where should they go? You can find us at, on our website at www.expanded practice.com. That's the easiest place. We're also on Instagram um, and we're on Facebook as well. Fantastic. And we'll have all of those links in the show notes, including the links to the uh, the resources uh, Danielle has mentioned to make sure that if you want to learn more, you can go ahead and check that out and uh, and definitely learn some learn some cool stuff to make your life better, make your patient's life better or uh However, uh, you want to just go ahead and continue to learn about your own recovery. Uh, So, Danielle and Maribeth, thank you so much for joining us here uh, this week. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Bill. Thanks so much. Now let's talk about like-minded. In addition to all the physical aspects and exercises that go into recovery, there is also the need for a community of like-minded folks that can support us. In addition to the value of local support groups, many survivors also benefit from a more formal education program. Like-Minded is a nonprofit membership group that can help. Like-Minded features virtual training and meeting sessions with doctors, therapists, survivors, and more, really the whole gamut of the stroke community. Members also get access to recordings of these sessions so they can watch at their leisure and learn more about the topics discussed. And for additional support, there is also a private text messaging group so survivors can get even more of their questions addressed. Get the support you need and deserve to live your best post-stroke life. To find out if like-minded is right for you, visit strokecast.com slash like-minded. Use promo code strokecast to save 20% off your first month.
In the next episode, Sophie is going to join me and Maribeth to share the details of her journey over the past 10 years as she fought back from her stroke and her aphasia. The recurring theme in this episode, though, is obviously it's all about communicating without words. Sophie's aphasia is the catalyst for this, of course. We also hear that play out, though, as Maribeth recounts her phone call with the doctor who wouldn't say how bad Sophie's condition was as Maribeth and her husband zoomed across the states to get to Chicago. We see it play out in Sophie expressing her feelings to Danielle. We see it in how Danielle engages with Sophie non-verbally. And of course, we see it in the training program that Danielle and Maribeth created to help invigorate physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, language pathology programs, and other medical programs around the country. You see, we communicate in words and tone and pace and movement and in hundreds of other ways, big and subtle. We communicate without even knowing it, like Danielle did when she unknowingly winked at Sophie. And of course, Danielle described the electromagnetic waves that connect people's hearts. I'm not sure I quite buy that. It does feel a little woo-woo for my taste. But again, I, I, I also do have right side brain damage. What I do know is that our almost imperceptible motions and twitches and breathing rates and heart rates and bodily sense and winks and blinks and eyebrow movements and more all pass information to another person who reacts to it, even if they don't know why they're reacting or what they're noticing or responding to. So regardless of the mechanism, whether it's micro movements of the face, subtle changes in our heart rate or bodily motions or positions or the electromagnetic waves between our hearts, the result is the same. We are always communicating something. And the more aware we are of that, the better and more effective we can be as partners and colleagues and friends and care providers and more. At Expanded Practice, they do offer a guide called Eight Ways to Thrive in Your Practice. You'll find a link to that in the show notes over at strokecast.com slash expanded practice. For those of you who don't have your own therapy practice, like me, Danielle also makes the guide six easy science-backed ways you can help your body heal. Both of those are available when you sign up for the Expanded Practice mailing list. You can find links to that over at strokecast.com slash expanded practice. We are also now coming up on the beginning of May as I record this and wrap up this episode. It is just a few days away, uh, depending on when you listen to this, of course. May is Stroke Awareness Month here in the United States. Are you doing anything to drive awareness in your community or online? If you are, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Send me a note via email or Instagram and let me know. Those links are again over at strokecast.com. Finally, on a personal note, uh, I did celebrate the 16th anniversary of my 35th birthday back on April 14th. Uh, My girlfriend, Kathy, took very good care of me and we had a lovely dinner, very heavy on the steak, which was awesome. And it also makes me very glad that I took my statin and my blood pressure medication that day. It's interesting. I have a lot of thoughts on the day, but I'm not really sure what they are. Although lately I've been thinking more and more about the difference between being 51 or being 4011 or the 16th anniversary of my 35th birthday. So it's it's some interesting stuff to think about. Anyway, On that anticlimactic note, be sure to check out the links to Expanded Practice and to learn more about the work Maribeth and Danielle are doing. All those links are available at strokecast.com slash expanded practice. Share this link with someone you know by giving them the link strokecast.com slash expanded practice. Be sure to subscribe to the Strokecast email newsletter at strokecast.com slash news. And of course... As always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The 
The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.